Three, two, one. We're back. Hey, it's it's Sunday. What is the date today? August something or another. Second. August second. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, um, I didn't know this until like ten minutes ago. What? We switched. Um, we went from uh, Blog Talk Radio being essentially where we loaded all of our podcasts, and then then Blog Talk Radio would syndicate it on iTunes and Stitcher and all these other places. So we switched from Blog Talk Radio to Podbean because Podbean had a more efficient system. Um, and uh, well, another thing Podbean does is it uh, says on your podcast what show number it is. And until this morning, and like maybe fifteen minutes ago, I didn't realize that you and I have done three thousand seventy-six podcasts. I know. That's Holy crazy. crap. I know. I and then didn't. we didn't believe it, so we calculated it, and it's actually true. Yeah, we thought maybe Podbean did it wrong, so we That's set, crazy. We, we redid the math, we checked the math, it's like, holy crap, but I never even really thought in terms of having actually sure done 3,000 right. shows. It's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. That's a lot of blah, blah, blah. Especially from you. <laughs> hmm. No, I think that's, that's awesome, though. So I had an interesting email um, yesterday, and I uh, read the email, sat on the email, and then I uh, actually called the person as a surprise. Mm-hmm. And the, the gist of the question, it was a long-winded question. It was, like, way too long. And they were kind of – and I was trying to understand what the heck this person was. It was a guy. I was mm-hmm. trying to understand what the heck he was asking me about. Because he was kind of bouncing around, going from this topic to that topic. But really, the essence, after having read his email twice, the essence of what he was asking me was, is how do I, like, I can't attach myself to what it would feel like to be rich where my money's working for me, I no longer have to work for my money. And so, Hmm. because I don't have any real tactical, practical, my words, obviously, experience with what that emotion feels like, I can't attach myself to it. This is, again, this was very, he was trying to be introspective and I was Mm -hmm. appreciating it. So I was giving his email a lot of extra effort. And then, like I said, I surprised called him. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, I think, a very valid issue. Because if you've never, like, if you've never experienced something, there's no way for you to meditate on it, for you to try to manifest it, for you to try to, you can do all these things. But the lack of the actual emotional attachment to knowing what that would feel like Mm-hmm. will is a inhibitor to you being able to accomplish the goal because there's nothing that's going to be a stronger pull than you to for you than being emotionally attached to something that's for sure and Does it's hard to sense? do that if you have little exposure to it or experience with it it's funny you mentioned that because in the treasure map when we're doing the goal setting section there's 12 12 questions at the end of each goal in the goals of five areas of life and one of them is who do you know who already has this right or has lived this way and I, I review those treasure maps quite a bit with our coaching clients. And it's, you're right. Most people don't have that kind of exposure. They can't say, well, I, you know, I really, a lot of our clients are the wealthiest people they know already yeah. themselves. That's, which is a problem. <laughs> which is a problem. You yeah. have to go to a different sandbox. If you're the richest person you know or the best agent in your office, it's time for you to upgrade. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's something that's really kind of a fascinating um, you know, challenge a lot of people have is if, if they haven't actually experienced. And I was thinking back trying to explain to him that that was what the problem was or maybe what the problem was with him is that he was lacking that exposure. Again, it's a very classic problem all of us have. And I was and I broke it down to this, though I still am not sure this is the greatest way to explain it. But I remember the first time you and I had really good um, French cooking. <laughs> I mean, it's silly as an no, example. No, I totally remember that. Too. Yeah. It was I mean, in New York City. Uh, yeah, it was in New York City. You remember the name of the restaurant? Um, I will in a second. Uh, it sounds like a butler. Or so- it's something in French, obviously. Don't yeah, something in, in French. Well, so having had it was that... amazing, too. Having you had making hungry. Having had the experience of what it's like to have really good food, <laughs> it if you would have tried to describe it to me prior to having that experience mm-hmm. i would have just sort of like you know been respectful and polite and sort of you know shook my head and I, and trying to relate to what you're saying mm-hmm. but the reality of it was is i would have absolutely no attachment to what you're saying because i never experienced it before so for you to try to relay an experience to me that you've never uh, that i've never had before is you know kind of an exercise in futility and there's a lot of other things in life like that as well there are so many things in life that you know julie and i strive to accomplish and then once we've accomplished them, and we've talked about them on our past Sunday podcast. Oh, we should give our disclaimer. Yes. <laughs> I never forgot. 
<laughs> this is our Before Sunday. Before we go down a rabbit hole. This is our <laughs> Sunday podcast as where Julie and I debrief from the previous week and then we sort of focus in on what's coming next. And we talk about wherever the hell comes to our mind. Which could be anything. <laughs> Which could be anything. I mean, past podcasts, we talked about the booming sex doll industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not the normal show, everybody. We, we talked about, we've talked about aliens on the Sunday podcast. We've talked about... A lot of weird real estate stories. Whatever the strangest things. But, like, I intentionally try to seek out bizarro news to try to shock her with. But, as you guys can tell, after 29 years of marriage, it's very difficult good for me luck. to find anything to shock her with. <laughs> exactly. Keep trying, though. I will. It's a good I, hobby to have. It is a good hobby. It's, it's like an obsession. It is. Yeah, you used to be super gullible. Of course, that was like a thousand lifetimes ago, yeah, but about, still. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, yeah, I mean, if you're trying to understand what it would feel like to experience and to have really good food, and your best experience was a really great experience, but it wasn't something on that level, there's no way anyone's ever going to be ex- to explain it to you or no. sell you what the emotion's like. No, and we're not talking about a classic Mick whatever upgraded cheeseburger we're talking about well, like the real deal we don't need know. to be condescending i, I mean, don't maybe, mean it that way i mean you know maybe they went to ruth chris or maybe they yeah. went to some really fancy restaurant and and it was a fantastic experience and it was maybe exceeded your expectations and it was all that but then until you and again we walked into this experience not knowing what it was going to be yep. like uh, some actually mm-hmm. a travel agent friend of ours uh sort of he yep. set up this whole trip for us and and had us you know go to that restaurant that yeah richard lewis did that he did a great job he did um, and yeah, so that was an experience that sort of reset the bar for us when it came to, you know, eating and, you know, all the rest of it that completely and totally 100% rocked our worlds. And now every time, you know, we have something that's not on that level, which the, we've only had something on, mm-hmm. when we went to Italy, there were several, yep. you know, experiences that were similar. That, that same restaurant is in the MG or I don't was. know if it still is, but MGM in Las Vegas, they, we had a very nice meal there once. Yep. But it wasn't um, the same as New York though. No, it still yep. wasn't as good. And so what's it like to experience being financially free to be rich? It's a hard emotion. It's a hard experience to try to like convey because of the fact that you haven't experienced it. And it's just like, again, we can go, you guys can think of your own examples of things that maybe exceeded your expectations and totally emotionally reset the bar. Here's, here's one that most of you guys can relate to. Um, you know, Zoe Grace came in our life mm-hmm. about seven years ago, six and a half years ago, actually. Yep. She was born on January 1st, New Year's Day, New Year's Day uh, 2014. And mm-hmm. so she has been, you know, to, for you uh, parents out there to try to explain it to Julie and I what that is like. You could have been the best writer or best anything doing your best amazing job describing what children it would be like. And many of our friends with kids, they you know, tried. they tried and we, and nothing could, you could have said or no emotions that you tried to convey would have anywhere come close to what it's actually like, good that. and bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Life altering. Yes. I mean, but good and bad, honestly. Yes, but, but experience wise, you can't, it's not like, I used to think, a lot of people think, well, you know, we've got dogs. We're used to taking care of stuff. Exactly. It's not like dogs. No, it's not like dogs. It's not Much like anything. Much as we love our dogs. It's, yeah. It's, it is very different. Being responsible for little humans is completely a different, on a different level. Especially and that first and year. it can't, it's not a uniform. I'm, I'm not a believer that it's a uniform, like everyone should just be doing it either. No. No, I don't either. think it's, it's true. Not for everyone. You and I didn't. We, you know, we waited until we were in our early forties to have our first kid and the and our only kid. And and maybe we shouldn't have waited that long. But I'm not sure if we would have been uh, the good of as good parents as we are now if we had had I the kids. So. You know, I don't think so. For us, anyway. For us, yeah. And now some people are completely different, and we have lots of friends who are our age who whose kids are having kids now, which is kind of amazing to think about. You yeah, know, yeah. And you know, if you want a really big family, obviously, you know, that's a different lifestyle and a different trajectory, and that's awesome too. Well, but, but I used to never understand those people. Yeah, me either. <laughs> I used to be like, how can how can you have like, we have a coaching client right now that has four under five years old. That's a lot of work, man. Oh, we have Julie. We have. But somebody, I think it'd be a blast. We have somebody who works days. for us that has six kids. Yeah, under twelve, six children. That's amazing. Did you know Corey had that blessed. many kids? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, when you put all this stuff into per, in perspective, and you're trying to, I'm trying to answer this guy's question, like, yeah. and he's trying to attach himself emotionally. Uh, to what it would feel like. And so here's what I came up with when I called him. And it's kind of basically my best attempt. But and I'm going to share this with all of you guys. The only thing you can really do. And so like you don't. I, I can't sit, talk, express it like this because it sounds egotistical. But hmm. until you don't have to think about money. Do you realize the importance of having money? 
having money or have being financially free where your money works for you, you no longer have to work for your money, having that as something in place, what it does is it makes it so that you don't actually have to think about money anymore. Not thinking about money anymore as an omnipresent, you know. As your prevailing thought. Or even, even if it's not consciously prevailing, mm -hmm. it's subconsciously prevailing. Sure. And, and to not have that as a thing that's a dark cloud around you, you don't know it's a dark cloud. This is what I was trying to explain to this guy. Like he doesn't know how much of his thinking and his behavior and his emotions and his stress and his just every decision he makes in his life, mm -hmm. he doesn't recognize and, you know, y it's impossible to, uh, how omnipresent the dread or the challenge or the whatever word you want to use of, you know, fear of money, especially in your commission base and all that, how that is a absolute emotional, psychological and spiritual burden. You don't realize how much it is until it's gone. It's a whole mindset. It's not just one fleeting thought now and then when you go to buy groceries and you're checking prices and maybe using coupons. It's pretty much a prevailing scarcity mindset is underlying and it's also obvious. It, it's around you all the time. Every decision you make uh, when you have a scarcity mindset is... I'm not sure it's a scarcity mindset. I disagree with you on that point. That's no. not what I'm trying to express. When I'm trying to express what I'm different thought maybe it kind of exactly it's a, it's a kissing cousin to the point yeah. I was trying to make the point I was trying to make was I was not um, trying to explain to him the scarcity versus abundance mindset that's the easy button no, right? all I'm saying is if if you're in the habit of saying I can't afford it or I'm not going to afford it or I don't want that because it's too much it's very it's much more challenging to cross the bridge to what you're talking about where you become comfortable with the thought that your money actually one day can work for you and you can have that freedom. Well, absolutely, that would be a roadblock on the way. But even past all of the sort of, you know, the institutionalized boilerplate mm -hmm. mindset conversation about this topic, yeah. because none of it gets you there. No, I agree you, with that. Julie, yeah. I could explain to you until the cows come home how amazing sure. the French food at that restaurant yeah, in New York was, no but there's no, uh, everything I would say would always fall short. Yeah. I could explain to you what it feels like to have um, a, a little kid, but you know, back when we didn't have little it kids, compare. it doesn't compare. Nope. I could explain to you what it feels like to, you know, you and I 20 years ago, 15 years sure. ago even. And that doesn't mean I don't get it conceptually. It means it's not the same being explained to. Right, exactly. And so, yeah, intellectually, you right, can understand it. it. They're just words, but you don't have any emotional attachment it. to it. Right. So what I was trying to do is I was trying to figure out, and I still am. You guys can, Julie and I are bouncing this back and forth. And you could tell she didn't know I was going to talk about this, right? Sunday is unstructured. But like, how do we make somebody feel the feelings of essentially not having to think about money anymore or not having the burden of having that emotional baggage? Because once I think you experience the emotions of what it's like, stay with me, listeners. Once you've had that really great French meal or once you've, you know, had that experience with the you know or experiences with children that make you realize how much how much more significant life really is once you've had those experiences you don't go back i mean you don't go back from i can never just like hard reset my brain and all of a sudden have you know mashed potatoes taste like that french food right <laughs> i mean i mean every, everything is completely changed forever yeah. and same goes with with kids i mean if someone i can never yeah. i had a mindset before that was a little bit maybe lackadaisical about being um, having a family, but now mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine not having no, a family, me right? Too. I mean, it, so it, but it, it does. But it took, to your point, having a family. It took the emotional experience, but right. but those experiences yeah. they literally hardwire your brain. Definitely. And, and and I don't mean this in a mindsetty bullshitty way, in a woo woo way. They literally hardwire your brain. Your neurons yeah. and everything inside your head communicate differently sure. once you have these experiences. So how? So here's what I suggested that to this guy that he does. Um, First of all, and this first one is easier said than done, I realize. A again, if you can't, if you don't have any emotional attachment to it, but do your best to try to imagine. And done through meditation, frankly, helps. And you don't have to overanalyze what meditation is. It's just basically you by yourself with your thoughts. And you're just trying to meditate on what it would feel like. And just choose one thought to try to sort of. Not even you can't really have any thoughts when you're truly meditating. So you know, don't overanalyze again what I'm saying because I know some of you guys are experienced meditators and you're gonna send me a 20-page dissertation <laughs> on how to basically They're meditate. Now. You're missing my point. Yeah. The moral of the story is, you have to as emo emotionally connect with the feeling of no longer having to worry about money ever again the rest of your life, and you have to try to do that even if it's just for a millisecond, even if it's just for a tiny, tiny little you know fleeting moment. You're going to never forget the incredible feeling of um, 
reprieve from just the ordinary daily stresses that you just take for granted as being normal. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And everyone and everything around you is also swimming in that, or they're all, you know, everyone's crabs in the same bucket, basically. And so when you all of a sudden, you're a crab in this, you know, the bucket, the old crab story, right? You, you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, one crab tries to get out, the other crabs pull the other, you know, pull the, 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 the escapee back into the bucket. And that's in essence how we're all sort of stuck in that reality. But if you can for a second, be the crab that gets one little beady eye over the edge of the bucket, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you can see that, hey, on the other side of this bucket is the ocean, in which I just came from before they threw us all in this bucket. Next stop, you know, some dinner plate. But if you can, you can throw one little beady eye over and you can feel what that sense of freedom would, would uh, be like, you will never be satisfied being stuck in that bucket again. And somehow, some way, you're going to escape from the bucket. So it's impossible for someone to really, you know, have an epiphany much more than through emotions, right? So an, what an epiphany is, is it literally is a, a chemical release of endorphins. It's a chemical release of uh, adrenaline. It's a, it's a hormonal sort of reaction to um, a, sometimes a thought, sometimes an experience. But if you can give, you can give yourself that aha moment, that's what a lot of people call it. So mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you're looking for an aha moment and you want to know what it's like to be rich where your money works for you, you no longer have to work for your money. And let's drill down what that actually means because mm -hmm. some people, especially in this sort of bizarro parallel universe world where rich is mm -hmm. evil, you know, that's right. really how people are painting it. Mm -hmm. But if you can attach yourself to that emotion of never having to worry about where, to, where your grocery money is going to come from, your mortgage payment, retirement, you know, health bills. Uh, anything and everything that you now have floating around in your head, you're, you have constantly in your head working antivirus software in the form of worry, right? Mm -hmm. So if you could all of a sudden purge your mind of that sense of worry um, and the anti -so antivirus software could finally just sort of maybe not be the most dominant thought pattern that was controlling all other thought patterns in your brain, if that were gone, What's on the other side of that is true freedom because you would have freedom of thought. You'd have more tr freedom of um, your time, certainly freedom who you associate with. But mostly what you'd have freedom of is you'd have freedom from worry. You'd have freedom from that, you know, thousand pound gorilla that we all carry around on our backs, which is the absolute fear of um, not being able to basically, you know, provide for your family and whatnot. Yeah. There's no other way to express it. I, I, that's how I tried to do it with him. So just if you can mm -hmm. somehow emotionally attach yourself and then he can reinforce that with listening to through podcasts, mm -hmm. um, though it's difficult to know because a lot of people are tall hat, no cattle. Yeah, or you, have an agenda. Right. I mean, so many people out there are who act like they're financially, you know, they're rich where their money works for them and they no longer work for their money. But they're, they're not. They just basically are playing a part. They're trying mm -hmm. to be, you know, social networking stars on Instagram and all this other Mickey Mouse. The whole world right now is full of, you know, narcissism and just, you know, fakery. Just this sort of acting like you're something you're not seems to be rewarded in our society right now. That and being a victim, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can somehow uh, associate, find people that you know are, for a fact, are uh, like you want to become financially, just find a financial role model or even better find several financial role models you'll discover that your ability to emotionally attach and manifest the feelings of being rich where your money works for you, no longer work for your money, you'll find that those emotions strengthen because you're now sort of you know doing what Napoleon Hill said, which is you're forming your own mastermind. So there's two things if you don't mind vamping on. The first one would be essentially what rich is and how it's mm -hmm. attainable by everyone listening right now. It's not some huge number. It could be no. a relatively. And then uh, talk about the, uh, the mastermind concept. Yeah, well, I was thinking you were reading my mind, so I would say, you put a thought in my mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Can you so, put a yeah. thought in your mind of cleaning your room? I'm, I'm working on that one. <laughs> or I doing am. your homework. She seems resistant to those. Mm, it's yeah, too she, smart. Too smart. Yeah, she's got her force field on. Diet uh, Coke, not a beer. Diet Coke, I just opened, <laughs> not a beer. Coke, Some of you are accusing okay. us of opening alcohol beverages on our... We no, don't. No, we don't drink no. on our podcast. No. This is Diet Coke. Um, exactly. So, Rich is when your money is working for you... A lot of people think that you know if they were if you were to interview a person on the street, oh that has to be a million or millions of dollars. They have never actually figured it out. And again, I go back to the treasure map because everybody's number is a little bit different. But really, it's when you have your personal and business overhead covered, you're debt free, you have passive money coming in or relatively passive, as passive as possible, and you you really 
are not having to schedule yourself the earning time. It's coming in for you. Well, staying drilled down, when you go on, if you go into a, like a retirement calculator or if you mm -hmm. talk to a stockbroker who basically are their salespeople, nothing wrong with that, just pointing out a fact, and you tell them, I want to retire at 67 and I would want to be, and they're going to figure out, well, you're going to get Social Security and you're going to have less overhead because you're going to be living in a condo opposed to your house and your kids are going to be gone and you're going to be eating ramen noodles opposed to steak. Right. And, and so you're going to need approximately this much coming in per month and you're going to need to have this much saved, which means you're going to have to, you know, scrimp and save and you're going to have to somehow basically live, you know, at a level in your current incarnation while you're earning so you can be saving for the future. I mean, that's kind of the version of what they'll and tell they'll you. they'll give you a, an approximate number of what you've got to sock away. But the problem is, is that that model it does work, but it's really unattainable, and that's the reason so many people never accomplish it because the number they're going to throw at you is going to be a million or two million dollars. Now, you can invest and you could dollar cost average and over time the stock market and this, that, the other thing. Well, guess what? What if you reach the retirement age and it's during a down cycle in the stock market where you were able to save up that a million dollars or whatever your guy told you 20 years before you had to save, and all of a sudden that million's worth 450? And now you're 67 and all you've got is Social Security and you're going to somehow figure out a way to try to live on, you know, three or four percent of 450 per year or whatever it actually works out to. You know, that's what they do. So they'll say, OK, well, if you had a million dollars in the stock market, we you know, you could comfortably pull out four percent per year or at a million dollars, you'd be able to pull out forty thousand dollars plus Social Security. Well, most of you guys listening, that's going to be about five or six thousand dollars a month in retirement income, which you could, you know, for the most part, you could make that happen. But why wait? And that's the that's Julie and I's philosophy, and it's been our philosophy forever. We originally got there through buying paid off rental properties and paying them off or paying them off in the first place when we bought them. And we bought really nice single family houses in, you know, five different states and these rental properties, all of which we still own. And by the time we were, you know, Julie was 40, I was 41, we had enough income coming in from those rental properties to meet or exceed our personal financial goals. Julie says personal and business. I just say personal because it's easier to wrap sure. your mind around it. So for most of you, and here's the little thing that should be a sense of relief. For most of you, if you had, say, $7,500 coming in per month, you would be rich by definition because if it were coming in passive, it wasn't coming from real estate transactions. It wasn't coming from the sweat of your own brow. It was basically money coming in as if you'd had you know, essentially in that case would be something like two million dollars a month or two million dollars saved and it was pulling out, you know, eight thousand dollars a month, you basically be at that point, um, you'd be able to re you know, retire. Now you wouldn't be able to have a fancy vacation or, you know, you wouldn't but, but be you paying could live. You, but you, you could live are. comfortably. You would have the financial burden released uh, forever from your life. And you can accomplish that. Most of you guys can accomplish that through and we're gonna give you uh, you know, essentially some shortcuts. Um, in a second, and this is not what we planned. To, we had no plans to what to talk about. It's a good topic, okay, though. No, it is. yeah. So most of you guys can accomplish that in your lifetime. Most of that, most of you can accomplish that in five years or less. So let's just operate off the idea that you need seventy five hundred dollars a month. Now I know some of you in the West Coast or East Coast are going to. It's going to be more like, you know, twenty or twenty five thousand a month. So adjust accordingly. And some of you that are, you know, are going to be maybe thirty five hundred dollars a month or twenty five hundred dollars a month. But what we want to help you create is the emotional attachment to the idea that you could have money coming in passively that would essentially meet or exceed your personal financial obligations and, and in some cases goals, thus making it so you no longer are essentially having to work for your money, your money is working for you. Well, Tim, let me jump in here because it's not just emotionally attached to that thought. It's emotionally attached to the thought that not only can you do it, but it's not going to take you forever. No. This is not, you know, I mean, I feel like the accumulation of rental properties and paying them off took us forever because that that was a lot of work. You it know? was. And, and I don't think we do it that way. We wouldn't do it that I, way. I have, Again, I hell can no. Tell you, no, hell no. <laughs> but but I, I just wanted to focus on what you're about to say, which is it's not going to take that long. No, that's right. And that's, and Julie's bringing up a really, you know, I should have drilled down on this. If you have it in your head that you're always going to be, um, a slave to having to earn money, right? And you're gonna have to do that your entire life. And maybe someday when you're reaching this mythical retirement age, you know, 
assuming you have the health and you have the wealth and all of that, all the stars will align. But you're going to be, you know, at a point in your life where you're not going to even want to do as many of the many fun things you could have otherwise done in your life. And furthermore, your family is going to be, if you have one, is going to be grown and out, out the door. So you wouldn't have been better to have um, been financially free when you were younger, when you could have really enjoyed life more. So look, you can accomplish financial freedom as long as you basically cut through the bullshit, which is what Julie and I had to learn. No one ever told us what we're telling you guys now. Like the definition of rich, that's something Julie and I thought of because when we have, when we hit that number with our rental properties and it was over 20000 a month you know, net, um, we felt for about two seconds rich and then we realized that three of the rentals needed new roofs. Uh, four of the rentals were coming off you know, lease. There was a rental with a flooded basement. There was a rental where you guys get the idea. So the rental property was, when we were coming up in life, uh, the essence of the only way that other than maybe having a really successful business, which we did, or being attached to some sort of you know initial public offering, which we hadn't, but rental properties were really the only safe path forward, the only assured path forward mm-hmm. for normal Joes and Josephines to have any sort of you know shot at financial freedom or independence. And so that's what we did. That's the dog we chased. That's the rabbit we chased, rather. Um, so as far as the first thought I have is all of you should realize that most of you can be completely financial free or at least give yourselves permission to start focusing your best energies every day on something other than making sure you have enough stakes in the freezer, i.e. savings. And, you know, you most of you are you get complacent financially when you have two months of consistent cash flow coming that's in. True. And I hope hopefully from this pandemic that has back in March and it's going to be around for a long time, hopefully you're realizing that having two months worth of savings is a bad idea. And a lot of people have gotten so addicted to living on debt. Um, I was having a fun conversation with one of our neighbors and I, he's very successful, very wealthy and he's debt free. And so are Julie and I for the most part. And you know, there are certain things you do want to take out debt on when the interest rates are super low, but we might touch on that. But he was talking about the fact that I don't have any debt, but pretty much everybody I do business with in every every in every way and every capacity has debt. He, and it's an interesting thought because if you, for example, let's say you're a dry cleaner, and let's say your store is paid for, your equipment's paid for, you have no debt, but you're in a and let's say you're even positioned perfectly in a an upper middle class, you know, rich area where people get their dry cleaning done on a regular basis. If you hear wind blowing, it's because there's wind blowing. Julie and I do this Sunday podcast at the beach. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, okay, that guy seems like he's in a, he's perfectly positioned to have a lot of years of consistent success. And all of a sudden, the economy slows down. And his business is still, you know, everything's paid for. Everything's rock solid. He's got money in the bank. Everything's great. But then all of his customers stop coming. And all of his customers, mm-hmm. let's say a lot of his customers are well off too, but, you know, they're carrying some debt. And then they, you know, their debt uh, ability to meet their debt obligations collapses. And maybe the companies that these guys work for in this little small town, maybe they're not able to, you know, you guys get the point. So the domino effect of essentially having our, um, our economy w- that's pre- predicated on the ability to borrow. That's really what keeps the U.S. economy afloat is the ability to borrow. So many of you wouldn't be living the lifestyles you are now. And I'm not just talking about houses and car loans, but the people that you do business with, real estate agents, when you're you know, doing a, uh, selling a house, that person's most likely borrowing the money to buy that mortgage. And maybe they even borrowed the money to, um, you know, start a business and maybe that you guys get the idea it's all a bunch of dominoes predicated on people's ability to borrow money and it never ends Um, so when you get to the point where your income comes from sources that are not dependent on people with borrowed money uh, ability to borrow more money then you're at a financial freedom at a different level because then you've stepped aside from a lot of the i think fragility of the economy that we're going to start seeing playing out going into next year that sounds like a long, breathy no, diatribe. Does it make sense? No, yeah, but that's that's an excellent secondary point with having the money coming in, but having the consistency of it and not being dependent on the economy, not being dependent on everybody else's economy, not being dependent well, on... Well, look at our rates. tenants. You know, yeah. I mean, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, the last recession, how many people I can go through thinking like... You know, uh, you, like you would go to get your hair cut and talk to the salon owner, and she's like, yeah, people are waiting a lot longer than they used to to get to, on a haircut. What is that, $19? But she was dependent oh, on... Oh, you mean during the recession because people didn't yeah, have the money. Yeah, they didn't. And uh, I, I just, I remember so many different instances of that where, you know, anything discretionary is over with. 
Right. But to your point, having not just having the money coming in, but having the uh, security of it being month in and month out for the rest of your life. Well, that that's the yeah. problem. That was what we discovered with rental properties. That's what we discovered. Even paid off. Right. I mean, so our tenants, there was an article, and we're going to talk about this on timandjulieharris.com, our main, it's a you know, blog website with tons of articles. We put up four or five new articles a day. I sent it to you, Julie. Mm-hmm. But the, the consensus is that there's going to be some sort of, you know, foreclosure. Well, it's going to start with a, a um, an eviction sort of the eviction moratoriums are going to run thin. Yeah. You're going to see they're projecting what was it? Forty three percent of all uh, residential tenants in the United States can't make all or any of their rent payment. Mm-hmm. So there's an absolute um, you know apocalypse that's going to assuming there's not massive government intervention or continued massive government intervention. There's an absolute apocalypse that's going to be happening to rental properties um, across the United States. And again, read these articles on timandjulieharris.com. I realize nobody else is talking about it, um, but it's a ton. I mean, it's, it's a ton. It's, it's it was forty three percent, thirty three percent, but that's still a lot of people. Uh, that means that twelve million renters could face eviction over the next four months. And in places like oh, New York and Houston, more yeah. than twenty percent of renters say they have absolutely zero confidence in their ability to pay rent next month. Right. And, and all the while, new leases are also down pretty much everywhere. Yep. So all of us who were basically planning on, um, you know, saving and scrimping and getting by and doing everything, you know, living below your means to buy rental properties and, you know, putting in all that extra work and just everything. Um, the investment thesis that all of us been banking on for all of our lives is essentially under attack. And now we talked about um, uh, last podcast on last Sunday, we talked about the fact that it does look like assuming Joe Biden were to win. And I don't know if he is. I'm not being political. But if he were to win, he's already basically said 1031s are going to be on the chopping block. In other words, people's, uh, you know, flippers and whatnot who were taking the profit from one property, rolling it to another, delaying having to pay the tax man. And a lot of you who are doing flipping or who are doing flipping, that was that's been your you know, that's what you've been doing. Well, if you all of a sudden have to start paying capital gains tax every time you do a flip, are you you're gonna have to factor that into the to the equation, into the math. So if you're having if you make, you know, fifty thousand dollars and all of a sudden you have to pay say twenty percent in capital gains tax or ten thousand dollars, you're gonna have to start running your potential flips through a different um, you set of you know equations, and you're going to find a lot of the flips out there, flippers out there, aren't going to be able to make the numbers work, you know, and yep. they're going to not. So that's going to have an effect, un, unintended consequences. But then you look at, for example, the other thing, and I personally find this the scariest of all the potential happen, you know, headwinds to rental properties. Um, all these cities are already saying that they're running a um, a budget shortfall going into 2021. And they're all basically saying the only mechanism, because we can't increase sales taxes, because it won't make a difference anyway, because, you know, people aren't going out and buying Buying stuff. stuff And right. So, you know, essentially the sales tax lever, we can't really manipulate that much because it is what it is and it won't give us that much of an effect. But one thing we can do, these are the cities that are thinking like this, is we can raise property taxes because people won't have a choice to pay them. Mm-hmm. And they'll have to pay them whether or not the economy is going up or down or whether anything is going up or down. So you're going to see, and, and we were reading um, articles uh, about the states that have you'd think be the most conservative, have some of the crappiest budgets, in like Texas. Mm-hmm. There's so many of these towns in Texas where the government officials, there's another article I sent to you. Did you see that? I'm reading it. Yeah, about the government officials, like the the staff and whatnot of these different cities, and how much mm-hmm. they're getting paid. I, I was reading it, the one about beach towns suffering from yeah. people not buying stuff. And, but it was in Texas. It was yeah. in Texas, actually, of all the mm-hmm. states. You would think this would be the you last one. There was over six thousand people working for these little cities that were getting over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow. And there are people in Texas that have these, not even like governor, like the governor makes less than a lot of these comp trollers. There's people in Texas that work for like the city of Austin and Mm -hmm. whatnot. They're earning 250. There was one I think that was earning like $541,000 a year. And so all those bureaucracies essentially they're not going to have layoffs. I mean, have you heard any of your cities and states talking about laying off employees? Neither have I. And they're protected by different unions and whatnot. So what they're going to do is they're going to basically go after property owners. And if you're, you know, we're planning on retiring or living off the cash flow from your properties, well, guess what? Now you're having to share a larger portion mm-hmm. uh, in the property taxes, and that's going to happen across the country. So I just wonder, like, when if you're wanting to be rich where your money works for you and you no longer work for your money, I'm not suggesting you totally discount rental properties. But well, you probably just got a lot harder. That's all. It did. It just got a lot harder. And you're going to need to look maybe not in your own backyard because you might live in a state that has, like, 
frankly, Texas again has really high property taxes. And mm-hmm. and what were we paying in Georgetown? Two point two percent. Point three or four percent? I can't. Somewhere in there, it was a lot. And I think in Texas, the most every they're time I get the bill. I know the most they're able to charge is like three percent or three point two percent or something. something like that. But that's a huge amount of money. Yeah, but what you sent me last night was in an opportunity zone. So oh, there, did? there are still. Um, you know, there's you just have to look a lot harder. That one in Amelia Island? Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Well, so we're obviously still looking for real estate, but we're looking for yeah, different things. We're looking things. a lot harder, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, and we're looking for opportunity zone stuff because you often then don't want to have to be subject to the property taxes at the at same level. For a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, so um, when you're thinking about, okay, yes, Tim, I am willing to be emotionally attached to the idea of being rich where my money works for me and I no longer have to work for my money. The first thing you have to do, and we talk about this in Harris Rules, by the way, our book, on um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible version, paperback version, whatever, um, but get the book. And the first thing you have to do is obviously you have to have a business that produces enough profit, and then with that profit, then you can reinvest the profit into things that are going to make you um, passive income. And so I'm going to assume that some of you are sophisticated enough to know that you're going to have to obviously have um, a good, you're going to have to be able to be a very efficient business owner to turn out enough profit to be able to leverage some of the investment opportunities you have. But as we go forward, you know, you go through all the usual checklist of things that maybe would produce passive income for you. Well, the stock market. So let's talk about that for a while. I'm glad you brought that up because that was my next question for you. Oh, let's so, hear it. So let's say, let's say I either am I'm there with the rental properties or I've decided that's, that's just too much, um, you know, hassle and cost for me, too much risk for me. What about the stock market? I mean, you know, my financial advisor is telling me, well, you want to throw off this much money, you've got to invest that much money and you can count on this percent per year. So let's get cracking. Well, so it used to be when, again, Julie and I are uh, in our very, very, very late 40s, if not, maybe I'm 50, I don't remember. I'm in my 40s. Okay. You're just a little past that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. But um, when we were growing up, the, the thesis was your money would double every seven years. Yep. And you would be at, in retirement, you'd be able to pull out 7%. Per year and not ever have to touch your principal. So let me break this down. So if you put in it, let's say over you know 25 working years, you or some you, you invest enough money that it appreciates through the stock market by an average of you know it used to be seven percent was the was the assumption, and then once you reached retirement age, what used to be like 63, now it's 67. <laughs> you know, um, then you're going to be able to pull out seven percent per year because your portfolio. So if you have a million dollars invested in it and and it appreciates every year, let's just use the word appreciates, by 7% per year, you could pull out that 7% every year or $70,000 basically and never touch your principal. So your million dollars stays in place in your stock market portfolio and your 7% basically is money you can use to live on. And if you figured that into your investment thesis and maybe you're assuming there's going to be social security and you could, you know, comfortably retire if you had a million dollars saved, if you were able to pull out 7% per year and Social Security were there. You guys, most of you will remember having conversations like this with whoever your investment advisor is, a.k.a. salesperson trying to sell you stuff. So um, nowadays, they don't tell you 7%. Nowadays, they say 3 maybe 4%, but let's, let's count on 3%. So you save up that same million dollars and now you can pull out $30,000 plus Social Security and those two numbers together, for most of you, mean you're going to be living a vastly different lifestyle. Now, you factor in something else, which in our lifetimes we've only experienced, and it was as children, called inflation. Mm-hmm. So what if all of a sudden you're now going to, you know, you, let's say you saved up your million dollars or whatever, and let's say it's 67 and your stock market guy says you can start out pulling out 3.5% per year, which is what they're going to tell you. a year plus your social security benefit is, let's say, another, I don't know, let's call it $2,500 a month. Probably not that much, but let's just say that. So you're able to basically have $6,000 a month coming in passively by the time you reach retirement age. But unfortunately, that $6,000 a month is barely going to have the same spending power, um, you know, so... as like milk's going to be like $4 a gallon, you know, property taxes are going to be higher. Everything's going to be more expensive. So for you to live off the passive income that comes from your retirement income, following these old rules that frankly, Julie and I were raised on, it doesn't work. The investment thesis sucks. It just doesn't work anymore. So now you have to save up 2 million or 5 million. Good luck saving up that much money with having to pay that much in taxes. You could earn a million dollars per year living in California and without including your property taxes, you could be renting and you're still going to pay over 50% in all the different forms of taxes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so it's it's if you're having a, you know, a house payment and a nice lifestyle 
and all that, you should be able to save money making a million in, in California even after all your you state. And, but you, it, you're paying 13% to the state of California. You're going to be paying in the 30s in federal taxes. You're going to be paying you know, over 50% in some of these states. That's where your money is going. You're, you're shoveling all out the front door. Now you factor in the, the taxes that you know you don't have a choice. You have to pay your property taxes. And there's the sales tax. And there's you know, different states have different things. They'll, you know, assess your car is worth this much per year and you have to t- pay a registration fee every year based on what the, you know, your local state taxing authority says your car is worth, road use tax or whatever. All these other taxes come after you constantly and then you're wondering why you're not able to save more money. And then you end up financing everything and having That's to right. have worse cash flow every month. That's right. And then the Fed makes interest rates lower and then you're basically, essentially, you've normalized borrowing whereas before... Just 15 or 20 years ago when the taxes, well, actually, you know, when Clinton was president, the taxes were pretty bad. But these are the types of things you need to be consciously aware of. And I'm not saying taxes good or bad. I'm not saying we're not, you know, not being political. We're suggesting to you is the probability of you being able to retire using any of the old investment theses alone is about zero. And so, like, you could do what Julie and I did. And we did both of those things. We've done the stock market thing and we've done the rental property thing. And we got to the point where where the stock market returns, you know, had we decided to retire when we were 40, which we didn't, but had, had we decided to do that when we were 40, our stock market returns would have been, you know, that we could pull out comfortably 3 or 4% per year. Our, uh, in the rental properties, even though the rental properties were producing really good cash flow per month, it wasn't consistent. You, and if, if, you know, we have a lot of rental properties in central Ohio, if Ohio State University, for some reason, were to start having layoffs, we'd see a bunch of properties go vacant. So... The lack, ultimately, it's about having multiple spokes that were, are going to create income streams sufficient enough to cover all your personal overhead, right? So you can have your business, and that business throws off enough. Now that's you know not passive, but you have business that throws off enough to pay off your uh, to cover your personal overhead. You, that's a spoke. You want to have a spoke that's maybe stock market spoke. You want to have a spoke that's maybe a rental property spoke, and maybe you want to have another business. Maybe you want to have. Okay, now let's be honest. How many of you are feeling completely overwhelmed right now by what I said, <laughs> right? If you had told me all this when I was younger, that that's what I had to have accomplished to, um, you know, finally be rich where our money works for us and we no longer work for our money. Well, I know what I, Julie and I did do. We said, okay, let's buck, let, we're, we're strapping in for the long haul. That's what we're going to do. And we did it. Um, but in retrospect, considering how fast the rules changed, how how much the actual you know rules book uh, completely got altered over the past twenty years? If I knew now, uh, you know, if I knew, I wouldn't have done it. I I mean, we would have bought rental properties, we would have um, you know invested and whatnot. But I don't think we would have. De- There's other things we would have done, which I want yes, to tell them about. Absolutely. I mean, what are you thinking as I say all this? I think that we probably would have still bought some rental properties, but we wouldn't have. Uh, sacrificed as much as we had to along the way to do those types of things. What do you mean? Well, I mean, because we were following that plan, we also made ourselves sell a lot more real estate so that we could do that plan. And we also took a fair amount of stressful financial risk, I would say, especially in the early years with doing like the guaranteed home sale and trying to cobble together enough commission to do a down payment on a rental property that someday we would pay off. And, you know, it's kind of like the top of the conversation we had where maybe that there was a bit of a, a gray cloud hanging over that in stress that we didn't even realize. But it's because we didn't have a lot of the same opportunities. Literally, we didn't have. We're not just saying we didn't do it. It just didn't exist that these guys have today. Well, it's kind had, of... Had we, there's no way we would have <laughs> done that kind of drill. Normally, when people get to where we are, they basically just spend a lot of time patting themselves on the back and saying how their path was the path to follow. Yeah. And what I'm saying is what we did was the only real path we had to follow. But I'm saying in retrospect, if I were the 20, you know, we got married and we were, how old were we? 20, 20 and 21. 21, right? Yep. And if we are mapping out our plan to get to where we are now, it would have, I think if we would made, uh, we would have made different decisions if it was 2020 and oh, we yeah. could have probably done it in less than 10 years opposed to 30. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yep. But it didn't exist. So... You know, I mean, I'm glad that we did. It's better than not having done anything. We're in a lot better position. Thank you, past Tim and Julie. But, I know. but to your point, if it's 2020, the, our current listeners now, if you guys aren't taking advantage of what's right in front of you, I really think it's like malpractice to your own financial future. How many of them right now are on bated breath, wondering what we're going to tell them? Some of them know. 
Okay, <laughs> Bitcoin. No, I'm kidding. No, not Bitcoin. <laughs> Hog futures. No. <laughs> yeah. We want you to short no. the airlines. <laughs> well, buy gold. Well, you should be buying gold right yeah, now, by the way. It's right. almost 2,000 an ounce. It's probably going to go to 3,000 an ounce. Right. No. Here's what we would do. There's no doubt. We would get our real estate licenses. We would absolutely kick ass selling real estate. We'd sell a lot of houses as we did. I mean, you know, what we'd absolutely do is join EXP Realty. And I'm going to give you the real bottom line reason why. Because it will make you, so not only, is, let's just set aside the benefits to the brokerage itself. The financial widgets that they built into EXP Realty are like nothing I've ever experienced in my entire adult life. Almost to the point where it feels fake. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Yeah, you, know, you have to check your facts, make sure, and yes, what your understanding is actually true. Yeah, I mean, there's... For example, EXP Realty stock, and again, Jillian are not financial advisors. Whatever disclaimers you guys need, just understand that we're not experts in any of this stuff. I'm just giving you the anecdotal observations. The stock is more than doubled this year. There are people that we know that were awarded stock, um, you know, who are now basically have hundreds of thousands of dollars in stock, and they didn't buy any of it. We know people that have millions of dollars in EXPI stock, didn't buy any of it, was awarded with it. I know somebody who has a net worth now from EXPI of over uh, or to right around $50 million from essentially stock grants and stock awards that every one of you are eligible for as an, a real estate agent working at EXP. Now, are you going to end up basically having millions of dollars? Well, you could from could. EXPI stock, but who knows what the stock's going to do in the future, right? Who knows what the stock market's going to do in the future? Well, what I'm saying is it is a completely passive source of wealth generation that you would uh, that EXP got a system in place already to help you basically benefit from that, but more urgently and more you know now money is the revenue share model. The revenue share model at EXP is something that if you don't pay attention to it now, or if you somehow are turned off to it, you know whatever emotional you know reason you have for not listening to the huge upside the revenue share model is, your future self is going to absolutely kick your present self in the ass because you're losing and missing out on what is without a doubt. I cannot imagine a better opportunity for non-connected humans. You know, if you're born with a silver spoon, if you are, you know, have a friend that's about to take his future Facebook public, if you, uh, if you have a, you know, rich uncle that's going to pass away and, you know, and his last name happens to be Getty, something like that, you're probably not going to have to listen to what we say. But if you're like 99.9% .9 of everyone out there with a real estate license, you have to seriously look at eXp Realty. N again, superior brokerage model, no doubt. But the ability to build wealth inside EXP for normal people, normal real estate agents, is unheard of, because normally what happens is all the wealth is kept by the owners, the franchise holders, the own, you know, the region holders. All the wealth is kept upstream from the normal agent, and the agent is basically just making transactional income. When what Glenn Sanford did at EXP is because he is an agent in essence, he made it so that the agents can benefit in a way that only before the aristocrats or the you know the bosses could benefit. He has literally made it so that every single agent who chooses to participate at EXP can uh, have enough passive income coming in from revenue share within two to three years, five years at the uh, you know just depending on how urgently you take advantage of the opportunity that you would never be able to create on yourself in, in ten lifetimes. And, you know, again, unless you have some sort of lucky star that happens mm -hmm. to be shooting over your head at the very present moment, or you follow the path that Julie and I followed, which given the same opportunity, I wouldn't do again. You know, it is kind of, it does make me feel slightly emotional, truthfully, mm -hmm. when I think about how much time and effort you and I put yep. into the me rental too. properties. I know. You know, and, and what and, we... And not just the rental properties, but all of the, all of the things surrounding that, the time, the effort, the stress sometimes, you know, Yeah. But, yeah, you know, water under the bridge. We well, but think about this from yeah. a very practical perspective, yeah. right? Sure. You know, we bought a lot of rental properties for cash. Uh -huh. You know, some of them were, you know, seventy five thousand. That's now worth two twenty five, which is what you found that one, which was amazing. You know, it's actually it probably, probably worth more than that now. It probably is. But guys, so let's use just use that as an example. So we bought. What year was that? 08, probably. In Columbus, that was Ohio. Like 10. That was towards the end. Okay, so it was seventy five thousand. Yeah. Now it's worth like over two hundred for sure. Easy. Yeah. But that money's in money jail. Okay. It's in money jail. It's in money jail. So we have all this, you know, and that house is paid for. We wrote a check for it. So I want you to think about that. Okay. Some of you think I'm trying to impress you, but I'm not. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is shed light on the essentially the way that, you know, we had to think and many of you are still thinking because you haven't realized what EXP is all about. So we had to, 
save up the $75,000, pay the taxes on $75,000. And then, you know, we had to, frankly, in that particular case, we had to get lucky and find that particular house, which happened to be in our prime hunting ground for rental properties in Columbus, at least it was. Um, and then we had to compete for it. We had to get it. We had to do some, not much rehab, but some rehab to it. And, mm-hmm. you know, we had to maintain it for all these years since 10 years, 11 years, not a big deal. We can manage it. Um, now the house is appreciated, right? It's now worth, say, 225000 So it's 225000 in equity we have in that property. But we can't get at that money unless we borrow against that money. Thus wrecking the cash flow. Thus wrecking the cash Well, I mean, depending entirely, how much we borrowed, but right. But, it wouldn't be the same. Though. Yeah. And so let's, yeah. so let's think about that. That house now is worth 225000 and that house is throwing off. How much does it throw off in net income uh, after a thousand bucks? A thousand dollars. All right. So two hundred. You can whip out your calculator. So that property now is two hundred twenty-five thousand. We're making twelve thousand uh, dollars a year off of it. What is that? Five percent. I'll tell you in a second. I think it's five percent. It's less. It might be less than that. Oh, it's very close to that. Just a tiny bit less. Four point seven five or something. Four point eight or nine. Yeah. Right. So if you had come to me and said. You know, Julie, give me two hundred twenty-five thousand. I'll give you and four. And that's point. on a good one, by the and way. And you'd say no. <laughs> that was a good one, right? Yeah, that was and, a good. And one. so, for us to get at that money, that money is literally locked into a money jail unless we decide to borrow against it, which would make the investment thesis even crappier. So, you guys get the problem, the fallacy of the whole investment property thing. Now, Jim, you need to buy multifamilies. You need to buy, you know, big apartment complexes. We've looked into the math and all that stuff, and we've looked into partnering with other people. We've looked into all that. And all that sounds great because the numbers are bigger. You have economies of scale. You have, you know, different ways of leveraging uh, up the properties. Well, all that stuff. But here's the problem. Those buildings have massive expense cycles. Those buildings are always in crappier locations. Those buildings are always going to be in a situation where a new division, a new building is going to get built that's going to replace it. That's the reason there's a lot of companies that make those big ass apartment complexes and they keep them long enough to sell them and they go on to the next one because they know that's the nature of how those buildings last. They're never made of that high quality and when they go into their first maintenance cycle after 10 or 12 years, then you're looking at a lot of windows, a lot of furnaces, a lot of air conditioning units. And if you just, oh, Tim, what are you talking about? 7% cap rate. Well, let's actually look at these numbers and let's drill down. And by the way, how much money did it take for you to even get in on that deal? And and then you're, you know, so, but it, nothing wrong with that. Okay. If that's your thing, there's a lot of people that have become very wealthy off doing, uh, off commercial investing, multifamily investing, single family investing. A lot of people have become very wealthy, but it's not easy. And it takes a lot. It's certainly not passive. No. And it takes a lot of money to get started. And so when you look at some of these investment uh there's so many i get probably two or three maybe more people every single day emailing through usually you know booking agents trying to get us to let them on our podcast to talk about how they're you know became gazillionaires from investing in you know whatever the hell it is usually it's in multifamily or commercial or whatever some you know bob was a school teacher working in the inner city of detroit and all of a sudden he had a spark and now he's figured out how to have now he's got 800 doors i mean i guess it's a great story but all it's it's ubiquitous, and so what is happening? What has happened is over time that investment thesis has been essentially attacked from all the reasons I've described. Now we're adding in property taxes. Mm-hmm. Now we're adding in essentially just all cool. these other things. About eviction are, moratoriums. It still works, guys, but it doesn't work like it did. But what mm-hmm. does work? What has no trailing expenses against it is revenue share from EXP. When you get your revenue share from EXP, there are no expenses against it. There is no managing of it. There's no property tax to worry about, no toilets to worry about, no roofs to replace or trees to worry about falling on your EXP revenue share. And there are, like, I'll give you guys a true example. I know I'm friends with somebody who in 2000 and I actually, you're not supposed to talk about money. We're not supposed to. Do you know that? You could call it Uh, beads or beans. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that clever. I know. But for most people listening, For you to make, it's a simple math game, right? So if you sponsor five agents for the next five years at eXp and they all stick around and they're all cappers, and in essence, after five years of doing, having accomplished that, if I remember correctly, you'd be making about $15,000 passive from eXp just by sponsoring five agents. So hover on that just for a second. Yeah. You said five agents. You didn't say fifty. Fifteen thousand. Sorry, fifteen thousand a month, one hundred eighty thousand a year. What? Okay, but you yeah. only you said five agents. You right. didn't say fifty. You didn't say five hundred. No. It's five. Right. There's no way, unless maybe you just got your real estate license and it'll take you a month to know a few agents. There's no way listeners don't know 
I mean, so many more than that. Five you, is such a low number to have such a high impact. Hold on. That's L- what what impressed me. I Listeners, guess we have to let the music go by. Can you hear that horrible music in the background? <laughs> it's a constant party here. Julie's point was really, I hope you guys heard what she said. So some of you are going to have explored DXP enough to know that the revenue share comes in from agents that you've sponsored or recruited in DXP. That is true. But what you don't realize is, is once you know what to say and how to say it, because so many people are already curious about EXP, having the sponsoring conversation is actually relatively straightforward and easy. Um, and it's not because everyone wants the same thing. Everyone wants to be financially free. Everyone wants passive income. So I'm going to go back to what I was talking about before. And I'll use Julie and I as an example with our rental properties. I'm not sure how much all of our rental properties are worth. I'd have to go and add it all up because we have a crap ton of them. But the answer is millions of dollars. And the amount of money that we're making per month um, from our EXP association, you know, uh, after about a year and a half is um, exceeding our net cash flow from our rental properties. And this is best case scenario on the rental property side by quite a bit at this point. Mm -hmm. So we're probably making 30% more per month from our EXP revenue share after uh, basically a year and a half versus the amount of money uh, that we're making from our rental properties after what, 25 years of investing? It's incredible to think about. <laughs> it's it does depressing. Kind of piss me off, actually. It does. It pisses me yeah. off, too, to be honest. If I had all that time and money back, I mean, think how much more fun we could have had, honestly. Seriously. Think how much and less... I mean, I think, why didn't we have that thought that Glenn had? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know. I know, but you're right. I know. I am. I, you know, it's true. I am jealous of that thought Glenn had because it's such that, a genius is, business. And it is something that we probably would have come up with if we had put our minds to no it. No way. You no, know, I don't know. It's no. just so... It's so... I think it's so radical for a real estate brokerage because... I can't name any other brokerages that are so agent centric. I know a lot of them claim that they're agent centric, but to actually have ownership and to have an because of that ownership and because of the model, culturally, I have found it's totally that different. EXP is completely different. Almost creepy, to be honest, yeah. how, how genuinely helpful people are. Yeah. And I, for a long time, I had kind of um, just assumed that culture was kind of a bonus. If you know, if you're at a brokerage where you kind of like people and you kind right. of like your your broker, that's that's great. But not to expect it because really that wasn't something that anybody prioritized. Really, it was all about you know the right split, the right maybe a good location, and then the rest was you know lucky if you could get it. But I I do find because everybody wins that's so much more supportive. You know, you help pe- agents all the time when they have questions. I do, and, and you call other people you know when you have questions. It's just. And and I you're never chasing each other down. Everybody nope. answers the phone all the time. I mean, I I have awesome. had I've had numerous times agents that are in EXP who listen to our podcast mm-hmm. that aren't even partners with us in our EXP revenue share group. Yeah. They're in somebody else's group. So sure. that's translating. That's there's no direct financial benefit for me helping them sponsor somebody. And many times I've helped them sponsor somebody. Sure. You know, and that's but I'm not alone. I'm not some sort of no. standout. There's there's so many people that's in the EXP that no matter what day or time it is, they would drop everything to help you. I've never experienced anything like that. We're meeting with the XP friends on Wednesday. Yeah, exactly. I mean, They're coming to Puerto Rico. We know them for EXP. Yeah. And actually, that's a funny story. Um, they've been associated with EXP for three and a half years, I think. Uh-huh. And they are, well, again, I'm, I'm not really sure of the legality of dis- discussing actual. But you can just be general. They're making millions of dollars a year for revenue share. Yeah. That's the general After statement. After three and a half years. After three and a half years. And, and they they were the, the most they were probably making before that would have been maybe two hundred fifty thousand a year, but because they've been associated with the so so the thing you guys got to understand is the reason it's the right place at the right time is because a couple things a it's a brilliant business model, yeah. Um, I mean Glenn and the managers and Jason and Dave and Stacy and Gene and all these other people that are essentially running the company and you know all the people the CFO and the you know they're geniuses the especially Glenn so when you look at the business mm-hmm. model itself it's like holy crap this it's almost too good to be true but then you realize it's not and there's lots of people Julie and I and you know really at this point tens of thousands of others that are benefiting from this business model but we, when you look at the business model and then you think about okay that's definitely the way forward for brokerages there's no way a normal brokerage is ever going to compete with that business model there's no way no matter how much money compass throws at an agent an agent's not going to take a hard look at exp because the money is going to be passive. Like you sponsor an agent today and EXP, that agent is going to, you know, you're going to be helping that agent financially and they're going to be rewarding you through revenue share 
forever, you know, as long as they stay at EXP. And so you can sponsor somebody today, and five years from now, you're still getting the benefit of having sponsored that agent, 10 years, 15 years. And that, that agent sponsors 10 other people, and you're going to get the benefit from that. A lot of people try to associate it with an MLM, and they think that's a bad thing. It's not an MLM because EXP is not selling a product. EXP is a real estate brokerage that has a revenue share model on the back end. Um, and unlike a, a traditional MLM that's all predicated on people being sold a business opportunity, the revenue share thing is not something everyone has to participate in. You don't have to sponsor agents to be a great EXP agent. You could just be at the brokerage. So just be very clear about that. But I don't have necessarily, a lot of people have, I think some MLMs out there are fantastic, honestly. We've never ever been associated with one. Um, not out of you know righteousness, but probably more out of ignorance, <laughs> to be honest with you. No, but you make an, a good point is that you don't have to do any of that. You, I think some of them might be subconsciously thinking, well, gosh, I don't want somebody calling me, asking me who, you know, who I've sponsored today and what I've done today. That's there if you want it. And if yep. you go after it, immediately you will have help and a, a very high level of responsiveness. But nobody's going to make you do it. So if you're having some kind of little accountability flare up, it's not like that at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You'll be so enthusiastic about doing it on your own. You don't need that. Well, most the, people, most people, you, you basically with the first time you sponsor someone in the first time you get like our first revenue share uh, check. I don't mind sharing this was a massive number. You guys ready for this? You ready? Eighty seven dollars and fifty cents. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> exactly. That was our first one. But, you know, the, the moral of the story is what we're trying to express to you. It's unless you're built with, born on a lucky star or a silver spoon. Unless you're, you know, best friends with the next Mark Zuckerberg or you are the next Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. which is entirely possible. Um, the probability of you being able to create enough passive income while you're still young enough to enjoy it, and you define what that, you know, age is, yeah. uh, doing the things that, you know, we've all been taught to do traditionally, rental properties and stock market and running, a, you know, all these things, nothing is the same as the... Uh, passive income you'll get from revenue share at EXP because even if you have a successful real estate practice and you have you know essentially that's a brilliant brokerage and you're making whatever okay you've done it better than anyone else that is not passive income by very definition because you have to manage the managers oh Tim I've delegated everything okay I got it but you still have to manage the managers if yep. you're an absentee landlord with property you know, managing your properties, your properties are going to go to hell inside, you know, 90 days. And you have to still pay the managers. Don't yes, forget that. Yes, exactly. So and, and the buck always stops with you. So if yep. the economy slows down or... So the second reason, aside from the brilliant business model and incredible opportunity EXP is for agents and brokerages, uh, and this one's counterintuitive, but the second huge reason why this is the right time to be involved with EXP, and you are in the right place at the right time if you take advantage of this, is because of the economy. And, and so there was an interesting article um, that came out last week, and we put this on our main website, timandjulieharris.com, that shows the number of people getting real estate licenses is increasing. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems for many of you to be counterintuitive, but it's not, because what people are doing is they're trying to create hedges towards their income um, maybe they're not that confident that their job's going to be relevant so they're getting real estate licenses or maybe they're looking for a replacement income or maybe they've kept their jobs but their income's not the same from their job so they're looking for you know other sources of income the point is is real estate licensees the number of people getting into real estate is increasing now at the same time that's incredible Who, where are they going to land a lot of them, as soon as they learn about EXP, they're not going to even consider a brick and mortar office because they're going to see what EXP offers. They're going to maybe listen to our podcast. They're going to say, "Why the hell would I join, you know, ABC Mortgage and not have any stock, not be an owner, not have a uh, opportunity at revenue share, not be uh, part of the fastest growing real estate brokerage in history?" You know, all these things, and they're all going to gravitate towards EXP. That is the natural direction that the real estate industry is going. And if you're offended by what I'm saying, or if you're, you know, in any way emotionally distraught by what I'm saying, just hear me out. I'm trying to plead for your future. I'm Julie and I right now are doing our best to try to get you to detach from whatever your emotional mooring lines are and realize that a year from now, to my point about the economy, mm -hmm. everything's going to be different. And by different, I mean dramatically different. And Julie and I have been, you know, reading statistics on today's show, but also on our normal show, and certainly our coaching clients. They know what the foreclosure, the looming for foreclosure short sale crisis is going to be like because we've been preparing uh, all of you. We've been telling you what the actual numbers are going to be like in terms of the recession that's probably going to turn into a depression. Guys, we're not in a V-shaped recovery. This is going to be a long-term, by long-term, three to five-year cycle. 
and the, the real estate uh, market that we're heading into is not going to be a seller's market. You're going to see distressed sellers and different, you know, at different levels uh, come out of the woodwork probably within six months. And maybe if some of you aren't taking what we're saying seriously, you might be one of them, unfortunately. And I'm sorry for you if that's the case. But here's the, the punchline. As these real estate brokerages try to meet their financial obligations from following this obsolete brick and mortar business model, they're not going to be able to when the real estate transaction volume slows down. Most real estate brokerages, if you have a real estate brokerage with 100 agents in it, you're going to be lucky if you have 15 agents in your office that are productive. So those 15 agents, your whole cash flow is, is you know, dependent on them selling houses. If they're not selling houses or if, you know, half of them leave and go to a different, you know, go to EXP, your real estate brokerage, which was probably making less than 3% per year, is wiped out. And now you're carrying all this fixed cost. And now you're carrying all these agents that aren't producing. And now you're going into a slower recession. What are you going to do? You're going to then have to borrow from yourself. You're going to have to sell your rental properties. You're going to have to try to get loans. You're going to go broke painfully and slowly. And that's what happens. That's what happened back in 07, 08, and 09. And that's what's going to happen now. You know, if you are thinking about, uh, as a real estate broker or a team holder, how can I create a hedge to towards that inevitable future the answer is revenue share the answer is being part of the XP the answer is looking forward and stop trying to keep yourself attached to old ways of thinking and old business models what are you thinking yeah well like I said before you know not taking that seriously is just so financially irresponsible I really believe that uh, especially after when I hear some of our EXP coaching clients say it's so funny. It's like the first time they had a great listing experience. They go, you're not going to believe. I looked in my bank account today, and there was $400. That was my first revenue share. They're so excited about that. Right. Especially when it's like they're not really consciously thinking of it. Like it just it, happens. It just happens. And then you tell them that they were also oh. given stock because they sold yeah, their first house. That's right. And the person they sold, uh, the person they sponsored, sold their first house. Yes. Yeah. That's, and they were that's given. Exciting to me. They were given the stock awards. Yes. Right. So just to clarify, when when Tim says they didn't buy it or they were given it or they were awarded it you're literally given it it's like a stock gift yep it's if awesome. they give you so when you sell when you sponsor somebody and that person sponsors sells their first house you are awarded it's just three year vest but you're awarded four hundred dollars worth of expi stock and so since we started a year and a half ago we have literally thousands of shares of expi stock um, of which we didn't buy any. So uh, that's the same situation all of you guys can be in. Even if you're just a low, let's say you're the worst sponsor of agents ever, you're just terrible at it, the numbers, because of the momentum this company has, are still on your side. Everybody is EXP curious. There's very, very few Especially people in the now. country that don't know. And, exactly. And as the economy gets worse, you're going to have more people EXP uh, curious. This is what we call it. And so for those of you who are EXP curious, um, there's a really cool video you can watch that gives you an overview. It's, I think, seven or nine minutes. And all you've got to do is text the word EXP to 31996. Just text the word EXP to 31996. It talks about the brokerage. It talks about agent services. It talks about lead generation. It talks about how teams work, how the cap works. It talks about revenue share. It talks about stock. It talks about all that stuff. So just text the word EXP to 31996. Text the word EXP to 31996. And let's get the conversation started. If you want to uh, talk with Julie and I about being a partner with us in our EXP revenue share group, and our EXP revenue share group is called Libertas. And Libertas, there's a big fly on your foot. <laughs> and Libertas is Latin for freedom. Okay, that's what that word means. And our revenue share group is called Libertas. If you want to talk with us about being a partner in our revenue share group, just text me directly. 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. If you're just in the getting, uh, you know, you're just in the curious stage, just go ahead and watch that video. And then after you've watched that video, if you have, want, to, want to have a conversation with me, that's great. And again, you just have to text the word EXP to 31996. So I can honestly tell you guys, if I were, you know, Julie and I just got married again, right? You know, she's 20 and I'm 21. Mm -hmm. We get married at, actually, you remember the name of the church we got married at, the Presbyterian Church? I just had a little epiphany. I remember. Remind me. Okay, for, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> tell me, sorry. Uh, I haven't had as much caffeine as Liberty. You. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, and Liberty and Libertas that's are the right, same word. The Presbyterian Church. Oh my gosh, Ohio. that's weird. That is weird. Precursor. Thank you, Pastor Tim and Julie. Yeah, are the church we got married at in yeah, Powell, right. Ohio was Liberty. was Liberty Presbyterian Church, 
and that was almost you realize that next month is our 29th wedding uh-huh. anniversary i do right and i wish uh that i could have had this opportunity for you frankly and for us back yeah, then me too. How, how would our lives have been different honestly Gosh, if we I could know. have built like we sold real estate 100 to 200 homes a year for about a decade and then we got into coaching so if we had to do it all over again and we knew about revenue share i will i bet you that we would have been living in you know the rich carlton of puerto rico when we were about you know 32 opposed to our late 40s you yeah, know for yeah sure. i mean so it's just it's fascinating that well the many impacts that it would have had well yeah. that it is are, that it is anyway. how would your life have been different in retrospect honestly i think we would have had more kids sooner to be honest with you yeah me too um, because i would not have been using that as an excuse so i gotta gotta go to another closing gotta go buy another rental property it wasn't really go, an excuse though you know I mean, it, it was, was real. reality. Yeah. It was reality. But what, uh, how, um, else, how else would your life been different? You can had, be selfish. Uh, we, we would have had more freedom sooner, for sure, to your Libertas point. Yeah. You know, I mean, that I think the fact that you named our EXP group Libertas should show our, should, our listeners should see how absolutely serious we are about this conversation. Yep. For all of them, you know. Um, you didn't have to do it that way. If you're in your if you're in your twenties or your thirties, oh really even your forties, and you're listening to this podcast, and you and have a real estate license, if you don't take this seriously, you're just you just. Well, here's the thing. I don't even know what to tell you. If you're especially twenties or thirties, but even you yep. know even some of our older listeners, but you know if you're just in the first stages of your career, being with EXP really makes it. It's like they're building two careers simultaneously. That's right. But the second one doesn't take near the effort as the first one. It's passive. And that's so unique. I can't name another thing, really, that's like that. When you sponsor somebody at EXP, you do have an obligation to help them get get going in the right direction. But after they've got going in the right direction, it's pretty much hands-off. And every time they sell something or something that they spo- someone they sponsor sells somebody, it's something all the way down to seven levels, you're getting paid off that. So when you have somebody like, you know, Julie say she sponsors somebody at EXP and they, they pay their cap and their cap is only $16,000, Julie gets 2400 bucks. Now, if somebody they sponsor then caps, um, you know, pays in their 16000 bucks, Julie gets 3200 bucks, right? And so, on and on. So, and on and on. And, and that's the thing. And it's passive. So there are people in our revenue share group, and I try my best to get to know every single one of them. We do constant we do. training and motivation and... You know, we do. You guys think we're off the hook when it comes to our podcast. You used to see mm-hmm. all the things we do to re- support our revenue share group, but there are people in our revenue share group that we don't know, and that we might ever no- not ever know that when they sell something, we're sitting here in Puerto Rico at the beach, and we're getting a, a portion of the revenue that comes in from that commission but check. We don't not know them because we don't want to know them. It's because there's several stages removed from our original sponsorship. Yeah, they, you know, Julie sponsors Julie. Bob, and Bob sponsors Sally, and Sally sponsors Steve, and Steve sponsors that, and we don't know. And so we have people now, I think, in every single state in the nation and in Canada that are part of our revenue share group. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. And we've done this in, in a year and a half. And okay, you're best selling authors. You have this big coaching company and you have this big podcast. You guys had an unfair advantage. We did. We absolutely did. But you have the benefit of being part of our group because when you are part of our Libertas EXP family, we're going to help you do the same thing. We're going to provide you constant care and feeding, constant training, constant support. I mean, believe it or not, guys, if, you have, uh, if you're have, if you part of our group and you want to sponsor somebody and you don't know what to say or how to say it, you text me and I you know, text you back and then I'll call that person and I'll get them sponsored uh, under you. So you'll be their sponsor. I, I do that probably. I don't do it as frequently as, as I used to because so many of the other people we have in our group now are able to handle it themselves because we have so many more people experienced. But I probably do it two or three times a day where I'll get on the phone on behalf of somebody who's in our group and I'll do the work for him, you know, and that's it. And so that's the kind of support you'd have being part of our group because we want all of you guys to have the full advantage, you know, have the full benefits of being part of EXP. It's something we're genuinely excited about um, because it's in perfect alignment with what our mission has always been, personally but also professionally, to give you guys a, a way forward that's going to create alternative financial, you know, futures that you would have otherwise never been able to have. I mean, if you're right, if you guys right now, going back to our original, you know, thought when we started, I don't even know how long we've been talking, mm-hmm. but. Um, if you had $7,500 coming in per month, you would be financially free, most of you. That, I did that survey, by the way. That's how I know the number is $7,500. Yeah, you're not guessing at that. No, I'm not guessing. The mic is... I can't move it. Well, get your little... I'm trying to make, not to make noise here. 
Yeah. So the, the reality of it is, is that uh, most of you had seventy five hundred dollars. So if you want to join EXP and you want to, you know, it, it, you do the sponsoring, become part of the a revenue share um, opportunity, you probably can create. And and it depends on who you sponsor. It depends on where you are and their price range and all that. But realistically, most people, if with given a, you know, you set aside some you know time every day. You um, maybe you just, I know a lot of people that just you know will focus on sponsoring conversations just on Fridays. I strongly encourage everyone to do it for a half hour to an hour a day, you know, because then you can build momentum. But there is a high probability that all of you could create seventy five hundred dollars a month in that range in passive income from revenue share at EXP within the next three to five years if you basically had a path to follow if you knew how many people to follow and there's a lot of information out there a lot of people that have given, given presentations um, and uh, you can again just text the word EXP to 31996 and you can start seeing how the math works but the timing right now is perfect because the world is going to push the real estate industry towards EXP because of the nature of the economy and because of the nature of the lack of profitability in real estate teams and real estate brokerages. So you can be part of that conversation. You know, we just, I'll give you guys a for example. We have um, in our group, we sponsored, and by we, I mean I didn't, someone, so I sponsored someone named Sean. Sean sponsored someone named Eric. And now Eric sponsored someone named Bob. Well, Bob is, is and I didn't even know Bob, right? But Bob is probably going to bring in um, uh, probably 30 or 40 people within the next six, maybe seven months. Now, that 30 or 40 people statistically may grow to hundreds, if not thousands of people within two or three years. All those people that came in from Bob, who I had no direct contact with, who I do now, but I didn't originally, all those people, when they sell something, we're going to get a little uh, portion of that revenue, right? You guys get it. So and, this, and by the way, you don't have to stay within your own city or your own state. You can sponsor anybody anywhere. A lot of you guys have been networking with agents like your whole agent career. That's right. That's pretty awesome. You know, it's funny too. I know some people. Are, oh my God, it's an MLM and da da da. Oh, well, but isn't every business an MLM? I mean, if you think about it, when when somebody's like an agent at um, in a normal real estate brokerage, when they sell something, isn't the manager getting paid something? Isn't the owner getting paid something? If it's a franchise, isn't the region holder getting something? Yeah, aren't nobody's the, weird about that. Aren't the aren't all the people that are involved in that you know that uh, franchise brokerage aren't they all getting paid something isn't that essentially the same thing aren't they all essentially revenue sharing on up isn't that interesting mm -hmm. and yet some of you you're the very thing that's going to keep you always having to have that financial burden is these thoughts that you have that aren't rooted in reality about you know different ways that different people make money I mean that that's just really that's the punchline with all this and if you think about a normal business I mean, when you go to have your teeth cleaned, you know, the gal at the front desk, you know, the person that's going to, you know, do their initial uh, cleaning of your teeth and the dentist and the person who owns the dental practice and the, and maybe it's a franchise too. Aren't all those people getting paid off of the same, you know, transaction of you actually having your teeth cleaned? Do you guys get it? Every single business, our country is predicated on people being productive and other people getting the benefit from it. There's no downside. That's how life works. Uh, you know, when you pay your tuition for your kid at college, Right. Think of all the different people that are getting paid all the way up the food chain from that tuition p a bill getting paid. Do you guys have a conflict with the fact that mm -hmm. when you pay, when you know, Julie pays her private school for Zoe, do you have a, you know, do I have a conflict with the fact that the the prevost is getting, you know, paid part of his salary from the money that Julie? No, that's just how life works. And yet, some of you guys, when it comes to how you can directly have that sort of model benefit you, you have all these ridiculous notions about. Kind of weird. You, it's kind of weird. It doesn't make any sense. It's going to keep you broke. It absolutely will keep you broke. You know, it, there's so many examples like that. That's just fal That's just old thinking. That's that's fallacy. That's the type of thinking that will make you lean on um, at business models and ideas that really don't work as well as they used to if they ever worked at all. That's right. So, you know, that's the cool thing about this is it's easily curable. None of what we've talked about is that difficult. None of it is so far out of any of our listeners wheelhouse that it's going to be complicated or confusing or too analytical. And, you know, there are a few things you've got to figure out. But you know what? You guys do uh, weekly calls where you're talking to each other about what does this mean and what's the best practice for that. You don't have to go to those calls, but they're there for everybody. to take You mean advantage we of. are Libertas? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Libertas is to help everybody out. So, you know, 
it may be temporary, I don't know if you would call it financial ignorance or business maturity that, that is working against them, but that's curable. That's why we talk about this stuff on podcasts is to help you guys. If I were, if you and I were in this position 29 years ago, you know, and someone was pitching us on EXP, I think I naturally would have been a skeptic because I Probably. had all this bad information about MLMs. MLMs right, right. bad. MLMs are scams, right? And it's right? easy to say, well, I, that's an yeah. MLM. I'm not going to. And, and I would have, it would have taken sure. somebody to be able to explain to me how it's a, EXP is not an MLM and how it's a revenue share model mm -hmm. that you can or can if you choose to participate in it. Well, and, so now we're full circle with the very beginning of our podcast uh -oh. where you were talking about why uh, the, the email person was saying, I, you know, I don't know if I can be emotionally attached to this whole financially, you know, your money working for you, you're not having to work for money. I'm not sure I get that because I, I can't really relate to that. Well, it's because you didn't have podcasts like this in your head exposure. yet. Exposure. It's because you didn't have exposure. And I'll tell you, I, I will confess to for, you know, EXP hasn't been around that long, but for the, Ten er years. For the early years, you, you'd hear about it in, as a coach from time to time. And I, you know, my initial thing was like, what is that? Why would you want to be virtual or whatever? Okay. And then we went to an actual meeting about EXP where I saw actual people get on stage one after another, after another, saying the impact that five grand a month, $7,500 a, $3, a, right. a month. It wasn't that it was the 3,500. It was that it was month in and month out. Think right. about that. That they didn't have to work for. That's what, what changed my outlook. That was my exposure That or my lack of exposure until that time. And then I had that big aha moment where I was like, well, heck, I mean, we're the ones that preach about multiple spokes. What the hell are we doing? But right? this, what, I, you, you know, know what? It's ego, too. But I remember too. that. But ego ultimately sure. plays into it because yeah. the, the thing that's kind of um, – I don't know. You and I are bootstrappers and we're all, you know, the sort sure. of traditional American values and nobody gave us anything. And it, yeah, maybe true, maybe not. But here's the moral of the story. The thing that makes this difficult to accept, at least it would have been for me, and I think it was for me, was the fact that it's not that difficult. I know. It's so counterintuitive. I'm so right? used to things being a struggle. Yeah. Or that it would that the actual numbers would have had to have been so much bigger, maybe it was unattainable or people so much are lying, no one's making that much money. I mean those yeah. are the thoughts that Yeah, I, and then we went to that event in Texas and I'm like, You've got to be kidding me. I know. <laughs> you know? So yeah. but to to land the plane from earlier, that you know, get yourself that exposure. And the first thing to do is the video. That is the beginning of your exposure of the reality of EXP. You owe it to yourself to at least have that baseline education. That's right. Know what you're saying no to, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, I don't know. Don't quite buy that no. Yeah, so text the word EXP to 31996 or we want to move the conversation forward and talk about joining Julie and I's EXP family and be part of Libertas, just text me directly at 512-758-0206. So Julie was rounding the bend quite nicely. And yeah, for the people who are wondering, like, what would it emotionally feel like to be um, – you know, rich, where your money works for you, you no longer work for your money, where you're financially free, there's nothing that compares. There's nothing that compares to the gift that you can give to yourself. It allows you the gift of being uh, present. As a self-employed person my entire life, and Julie as well, you are never completely present because the antivirus software is always running in the back of your mind, worrying about a deal, worrying about closings, worried. The worry is always the omnipresent thing. You will still have that initial pang of worry, but then when you remind yourself you have passive income coming in, enough to basically give yourself and your family financial security from your past efforts, that worry, it might still you know ring true. It might still be there because maybe some of you are never going to be able to completely get rid of it. I probably won't, truthfully. It's become so woven into my you know neurological pathways, but now the counterbalance to it is it's not relevant anymore. I don't need to worry. It's just an old habit. I don't need to have those thoughts. And guys, the sense of freedom that all of you guys can have from experiencing that, and maybe your number's 3500 a month, maybe it's 2500 a month, maybe it's 5000 maybe it's 7000 But you can be selling real estate, making money from selling real estate, making probably more money from selling real estate at EXP. You can be benefiting from the appreciating stock, which will create you long-term savings, which some of you will never have otherwise. It's just cold, hard reality. Average American only has $400 saved. And then you could be making... You could be on your way to creating retirement income 
or income enough to make it so that the money you make from selling real estate, because we're not suggesting you stop selling real estate, the money you make from selling real estate can go to doing other things like having fun, <laughs> you know, can go to having better life experiences or buying the new car and just doing different things. It creates multiple streams of income that frankly, if you don't do something like this, unless you have some, you know, gift from God that lands in your lap, some Willy Wonka winning golden ticket, mm -hmm. unless you have something like that happen for you, the probability of you being able to accomplish what we just laid out for you in your lifetime is is, is statistically zero. So do take this seriously, guys. You know, don't be buttheads like we were and waited, waiting as long as we did. We shouldn't have waited to align with EXP Realty. Yeah. You know, it, it's been a huge win for our coaching company. It's been a huge win for us personally. We've made so many great friends and financially, obviously. So you can just text uh, EXP, just the letters EXP to 31996. Or if you're ready to move forward, you want to join with Julie and I, just text me directly at 512-758-0206. And you know what? We hadn't planned on talking about EXP, but we almost always do. I know. Well, it's because we have such enthusiasm for it. It's funny, it's though, isn't it? It's easy to talk about something that you care so much for. I know, but is that funny? We, on Sunday, we always... You, it's, know. you know what it is? It's, it, it is what you said. It's gratitude. Yeah. It's gratitude so. towards Glenn and the opportunity and all of our friends. Yeah. And I think I, I also do, and I think you do, too, and I think all of our coaches do, feel a legitimate responsibility to help all of our listeners the way EXP has helped us and the way it's helped our coaching clients. Me too, and a lot especially of our, our podcast listeners. Sure, I, I do. I feel obligated to that. Me too. That's why our, we have to, you know, why, why would we keep that a secret? That's kind of nutballs. Yeah, and well, it's because there's a certain percent out there that are going to basically be washing, you know, watch, basically Tim and Julie are, you know, kooks and whatever, whatever, and that's fine. You guys will most likely regret not having taken this seriously yeah. in the near future, like in next year. Uh, but even if you do feel skeptical, even if you do feel a little bit, you know, angry that we talked about this and, you know, brokerage for some people is like, you know, a religion is such so weird. Yeah. You know, you don't think like business people, but if you just can set those emotions aside and just watch the video, um, you know, by texting EXP to 31996, or if you're ready to move forward, just text me directly 512-758-0206. You will find that the future you six months, 12 months from now, will look back saying and realizing it was the best business decision mm -hmm that you made even despite yourself you know that's the reality of it's it it's okay if you you know if the first step is to just be curious then you owe it to yourself to text to you know exp to 31996 i think howard brenton used to say get out of judgment and into curiosity that's for sure and so that's a great first step that's right all right you guys have a fantastic day thank you for helping uh put i think this is show 3080 or 3079 in the can so you guys have a fantastic day we'll talk to you on the regular podcast tomorrow